my name is Doug. I'm chair of undergraduate programs here at Argosy. I've been here since 2003. I taught the second class in the BA psych program and I've basically been here ever since. I uh, moonlight from time to time in the counseling psych program. I am a clinician counselor, counselor by trade, um, and so I, have, I think I've been practicing for about 13 years or so. Um, and so a lot of what I'm going to bring today um, comes from my clinical experience. Certainly it comes from my training, certainly it comes from a lot of the research that I've done, but a lot of it will just be me being in the trenches trying to do the stuff that I've learned in the classroom. And so to begin with, um, where my title came from is my wife and I were vacationing this summer in the south and we were at uh, one of my wife's friend's houses. They had a couple little girls. Um, and we have two little boys, Noah and Luke, they're four and three. And so Noah, my older son, wanted to play with, there was this, I think it was a Lego set, um, and it was clearly in a girl motif, pink and purple, right? And so Noah loves Legos and he wants to play. And so he's on the ground with these little girls and he's saying, he's just sort of bellying up there, wanting to play. And the one girl says, you can't play with that. That's just for girls. And so in me, there was sort of this rage response, right? Like I watch my son, um, he's sort of dumbfounded. He doesn't know that Legos are for girls, right? He doesn't get the color scheme thing. And yet something in that interaction was telling him as a four-year-old, hey, here is your gender. Here is your experience. Here's what's okay for you, and here's what's not okay for you. And me, as the egalitarian counselor that I am, the, really the man who's been wounded in gender, in my own engendered experience, I want to come to the rescue, right? I want to save the day. I want to enlighten this little girl that it's okay. I want to enlighten my son that it's okay. And I didn't do much of anything beyond just saying, it's okay to play if you'd like to. But that experience has stuck with me and sort of even helped me to remember my experience of being a man who counsels and being a man who's in counseling. So that's sort of the, the nature of um, what we'll talk about today. So just to sort of prime the pump here a little bit, I want you to speak in a non-PC way, if you would. So just quickly, what are the, the stereotypes or the caricatures that you know are out there about men who counsel? Shoot, what's that? Pedophiles. Pedophiles, okay. The, the, the counselor themselves are kind of, ah, okay, so they're stalking, right? Grooming, okay, yep, okay. Long hair and sensitive ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> Call it a stereotype, no longer, okay? But yeah, but I should, I should probably have the like patchwork on my jacket, right? And I should probably have not just a goatee, but a beard, right? And I should probably do a lot of attentive listening stuff like, hmm, ah, right? Anything else? Yeah. Smoke a pipe and have a bad cocaine problem. There you go, right? So lots of Freudian wannabes, right? In many ways, he is the icon for our field. And I think in some ways, we're recovering from the character, caricature that was put out there by good old Siggy, right? OK, so hold those in mind as we go forward here, OK? And ultimately, my thrust, uh, the thrust of this talk is going to be, I'm not sure that the counseling field has figured out how to be pro-male yet. Okay, uh, we, we have since Freud, certainly, we have been male dominated. And uh, if you look at the demographic trends in graduate programs, in mental health treatment facilities, this kind of thing, the great news, the absolute great news is that women are on the scene and they're here to stay, right? And I think in some ways they're saving our profession. And yet I look at our numbers and you'll see some numbers that I'll have here in just a little bit. And I say, where are all the men? Right? As a professional, um, oftentimes I'm asked, do I know of other guys doing therapy? You know, if I'm not a good fit for a, for a certain client, I'm asked, do you know of any other men who work with such and such? And a lot of times I have to say no. So really what I want to look at is where are we as a field in terms of our evolution and how kind are we being to any gender? Okay? Knowing that historically we haven't necessarily been so kind. To give it just a little bit of relevance, I want to I wanna, um, talk just quickly about a few movies and show just a quick clip from one. Anybody seen my Big Fat Greek Wedding? Okay, years ago when I was in a divinity program, uh, I showed a clip um, from that movie where basically the women in this Greek family have to convince the Greek patriarch that there's an idea that's good, right? And what they know is that this man 
needs, the buy-in is that he needs to endorse it, right? He needs to be the one that has the power. He needs to be the one that says yes to it. So they have created this plan. They've acted on the plan. They're, they're, the plan is working, and yet they have to get the quote-unquote male blessing, right? And there's this sort of pivotal scene where they speak of the man being the head, but the woman being the neck that can in many ways control the head, okay? Um, there we have, I think, a good picture of some of what patriarchy, male dominance, has done to men. It kind of makes us look like buffoons, okay? Think about, we're heading into the Super Bowl, right, on Sunday. Think about when you, when you pay attention to commercials on TV, um, if, when we think about male, female gender, which gender is made fun of more often in commercials? men, right? Or at least maybe I'm just sensitive and I see it more, right? There's all these commercials, especially in football, of course you get all the, you know, beer and such, right? But then invariably there's some AT&T commercial or something that, again, shows this head-like figure who's really kind of sort of a buffoon. Now, next video or next movie, Hitch. How many folks have seen Hitch? Okay, so we're gonna watch a little clip from this. So the story of Hitch goes, Will Smith is sort of this relation whisperer guy, right? So men who don't have their relational acts together, this is specifically romantic, uh, their acts together, come to Will Smith to, in essence, work their stuff out. And so this guy, uh, what's his name? Uh, Albert Brenneman, Brennan? Brenneman, is gonna go to Will Smith to get his stuff acted out. And so Albert is quite interested in this woman, Allegra. And so what I wanna, want us to watch, it's about a three minute clip, I want us to watch the interaction between these two men, the relationship whisperer and the man who needs help. And then we're gonna think just a little bit about what might this have to do, this sort of interaction, caricature of an interaction, what might it have to do with counseling? Okay, again, he's a buffoon, right? How about Will Smith's character, does he have it? Supposedly, right? But here's part of the tension. If you watch the movie, what you know about Will Smith is he sort of falls apart relationally himself, right? So he's this relational whisperer by day, but he's sort of the buffoon-like guy by night or in real life too, right? As a man who's been on both sides of the counseling couch, I felt like Albert going to, I remember back to my first time in counseling 10 years ago, I felt like the man coming in looking like this with no emotional intelligence, no clue about my life, my life, no whatever. I've also at times recognized myself in Will Smith's character of feeling because of the way that, because of what patriarchy has said about men and who we are to be in this culture, I've sort of felt like I am to be that guy. I am to be the one who coaches and who guides and who makes relevant that which is irrelevant in men. And I think the dilemma of that is ultimately it fur furthers a sense of power that I don't believe is helpful for any gender in counseling. So here's where we're going with this. Um, I want to show you just quickly um, a few pieces that are out there in the media about this topic. Uh, and I'm not necessarily claiming that any of these are accurate from an academic or scholastic perspective, scientific perspective, but just even here's the buzz that's out there. And I want to do that under the guise of saying, um, I went to a presentation a couple years ago by the, these guys, Barry McCarthy and Michael Metz, both uh, very renowned sex therapists, who were speaking about being pro-male. And it was really one of the first times that I had heard anyone speak of this, a clinician, a researcher, speak of this in the way that they spoke of it before. These were guys that were big in the marriage and family and sex therapy circuit. A lot of what I do is couples counseling. Uh, and most of my practice is made up of heterosexual couples. And so, again, I was quite interested as they went on to say that they believe the field is not very pro-male. Now, pro-male doesn't mean anti-anything. Right? Part of what they were speaking to are, is sort of this binary contrast that we get in our ideologies that say male and female are opposite genders. Right? For someone to be pro-male, that means they must be anti-male or anti-gay or anti-queer or whatever that is. Right? And so what, what, as I speak of being pro-male or exposing sort of the anti-male biases, please don't hear me saying anything other than just that. I'm not trying to draw sort of a binary differential of, I'm not really for women, but I sure am for men, okay? I'm not for gay folks, I'm for, no, this is really just a sense of how do we think about treating, engaging honestly, ethically, a population that at least some authors speak of as being hidden, 
Okay, so here's some of what's out there in the mainstream media. Uh, here's a glamour study, just January, right? Where um, they're polling the public and basically here's what shows up in this public poll. Men are to be, this was a, this was a study, I think it was a, an interview, or excuse me, a survey that was sent out to folks. Men were found to be more dominant, res, uh, reserved, utilitarian, vigilant, rule conscious, emotionally stable, while women are differential, uh, warm, trusting, sensitive, emotionally reactive. On to the chronicle of higher ed, looking at the stats in higher ed and who's doing what, both at the undergrad and the grad level. These are stats about uh, undergrads specifically. 46% of the respondents thought gender trends in higher education are a quote unquote bad thing. And again, as the public is polled, here's the way that this, uh, this article ends. There's, this is the public. They're supportive of all the accomplishments of women in this regard, but they don't want to see that, that success come at the expense of men. Lots of ways to interpret that comment, right? But again, this is some of the buzz. Next, need therapy. A good man is hard to find. So in this article, this gentleman is speaking to the feminization of the mental health field. Today, the takeover is almost complete, is a quote. Now, I don't know how, again, how um, uh, valid these stats are, but at least here's one person's uh, viewpoint. Uh, men earn one-fifth of the master's degrees in psych, down from the 70s. 10% of the AP ACA's membership are made up of men, relative to the 30% back in 1982. Apparent decline in, in marriage and family therapists as well. Uh, the proposal is that some of the shifts, demographically speaking, uh, have to do with economics. If a man sees himself as needing to be that primary breadwinner, maybe some of the men went with where the money went in the 90s with managed care rolling out into psychiatry and away from counseling and therapy proper. And this guy, Ronald Levant, who I'm gonna uh, cite here uh, quite uh, in a good bit, uh, a good bit in a little bit, uh, says, what doesn't necessarily matter is what's true, right? This is like, what, what gets published in research isn't always right, it's just interesting, right? And so what Levant is saying is, what matters in this gender discussion is what clients are thinking. It isn't necessarily what's quote unquote true. And so here specifically, he was referencing the idea of men can only get good counseling from other men. And of course, not true, right? But if that's a man's perception, well, that's what we've got to work with. Here's another article. This is from Newsweek, uh, 2010. Uh, check out these quotes. Men have matched or overtaken, excuse me, women have matched or overtaken men as a percentage of students in college and graduate school, while men have retained their lead in alcoholism, suicide, homelessness, violence, and criminality. I was reading an article this morning, uh, a guy who's uh, a therapist who uh, works in the field, and his beef was when you look at the studies that come out in terms of gender, anytime we're looking at an engendered study or a gender the fo uh, study that focuses on gender that has sort of women as their focus, there will be a title that's snappy and positive. Something uplifting, something about liberation, something about hope and encouragement. And then if you look at um, the titles of journal articles that are published in terms of men, it's something to do with what men need to overcome. So even the titles of journal articles, at least per this one author, might be tilted in the direction of, let's make room for the feminine, let's make room for women, and that which is male needs to be superseded, overcome, replaced, something. Another quote, uh, but suggested that men should stick to some musty script of masculinity only perpetuates the problem and it does nothing to help them succeed in school, secure sustainable jobs, or be better fathers in an economy that's rapidly outgrowing Marlboro manliness. So here I think is part of the tension of gender conversations. Um, what I'm gonna be uh, continuing to talk about here isn't necessarily intended to be normative to say what is, more so to be descriptive around here's some of the layouts of what we, what we have to face. And I think one of the tensions is we, we have a sense that Marlboro manliness, sort of the old version of what I'll call hegemonic um, masculinity, isn't necessarily honoring, isn't necessarily healthy, but folks don't always have a sense of what they want to replace that construct of masculinity with. So in other words, there might be a growing sense of what liberation from a quote unquote female perspective looks like, but maybe not so much from men, okay? And one of the um, texts that I wanna use 
as sort of a backdrop um, to think this whole issue through is the pedagogy of the oppressed. How many folks have heard of this uh, text? It's been out there, it's in its 30th edition printing. Paulo Freire is, um, he was a Latin American philosopher looking at lots of different forms of oppression, including paying attention specifically to what technology does by way of oppression. Here's how he defines oppression, okay? Any situation in which A objectively exploits B or hinders his or her pursuit of self-affirmation as a responsible person. So ultimately his argument is gonna be oppression prevents people from being fully who they are, fully human. Okay, so here's a kicker. What he'll argue is that the oppressor, the one who has the power, the one who is lording over, is as dehumanized as the one who's being dehumanized in the first place. Okay, so his argument again is any, any oppression that we find anywhere will be oppressive to both the oppressor and the oppressed because neither one gets to be fully who they are. Okay? The greatest humanistic and historical task of the oppressed is to liberate themselves and their oppressors as well. So this, I think, is lovely. And this, I think, is great news for the counseling field. What Freire is going to say is it's the oppressed that get to save the oppressor. So if we're in a country, if we're in a culture, even in a field in some ways, that has been male-dominated, that might have oppressed women, remember back to Freud's thing of hysteria, right? Women just have a wandering uterus, right? Okay, so if we are in a field, in a culture that hasn't been kind to women, it's great news that women now make up a large percentage of our practitioners because they're gonna be able to speak a voice that's different than the oppressor, the quote unquote male, could speak, okay? And ultimately what Freire is gonna say is, the oppressor is too stuck. They've got the power, they don't know what to do with it. They're, they've been blinded to what being fully human means and therefore they need someone else, something else to speak into their lives. As the oppressed work their way to freedom, they can invite the same to or for the oppressor, okay? So nothing that the oppressed does per se is for the oppressor. It's more so as they work to liberate themselves to figure out what does it mean for me to be a fully human person, they invite the same in the, group, in the person or the groups of people that have been oppressing them. Only as they discover themselves to be the hosts of the oppressor can they contribute to the midwifery of the liberating pedagogy? I think that's lovely, right? The idea that in some ways, so if we're having a, a conversation about gender, about men and women, in some ways, women have been forced to play host to a male-dominated way of doing things, right? And so as they discover that, they can begin to midwife something different. True solida solidarity is found only in the plenitude of this act of love in its existentiality, in its praxis. And so again, it's the acts of those who have lived under. It's the hope of those who have lived under that can actually move things forward in Freire's viewpoint. So let's kind of hold that as we move forward. Um, this is something called the male code, comes out of a gender, gender text, psych of gender text uh, from Brannon. She argues that our society uh, endorses, or at least historically has endorsed, the male code, which involves these four tenets. So compare this, you're a man, you're a woman, compare this with what you were taught, either explicitly or implicitly, about what it means to be a man. First of all, don't appear feminine. Next, uh, respect comes through achievement. Be a doer. Make something of yourself in the world. Be successful, right? The sturdy oak, don't show weakness. This is gonna be a big deal as we get into talking about all of our male vets who are coming back with significant needs. And what they've been taught, not just as men, but as men in the military, about what strength is, what weakness is, right? And then give them hell. So seek adventure and risk, again, be that go-getter, be that Will Smith kind of guy who looks like he can take on anything, and if need be, Use a little violence, invite somebody out to the, to the back alley to take care of business, if need be, okay? Male code. 
Socialization patterns. Men are taught the language of power, dominance, competition, and control over expressions of feelings and vulnerabilities. So again, if we think about oppressor and oppressed, um, if being the oppressor means that you are oppressed, take a look. If masculine identity is socially powerful, gives one a right, quote unquote, to oppress someone else, silence and denial are effective social strategies to protect the masculine identity. In just a little while, I'm going to talk about the researcher John Gottman. And what he's found is killers to relationship are what he calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Anybody know about these things? They're the things that people do when their defenses are pressed into to basically push off of their relational partner, right? And one of the most common four horsemen used, especially by men, found through his research, is something called stonewalling. Right? You, you know this, right? Okay, so in other words, if something's happening between my wife and I, she said something that's hurtful, that's irksome to me in whatever way, I'm gonna have a big internal response and maybe even my good intention will say to me, whoa, I've gotta step back from this. I've gotta be silent because everything that I've been taught hasn't prepared me for what to do in this moment. Okay, so again, can we see if we have a man code, if we have a culture that says to us, here's how a certain gender is supposed to be, it's constrictive all the way around. If men are to be these things, if, if this is a piece of the code that we've been handed, then what happens to a man when he's in a relational moment that requires something other from him? And then what happens when that man steps in to the role of being a counselor? Or what happens if that man decides that he wants to go and be in counseling himself? Social psychologists remind us that people who are recipients of prejudice bear its marks. So does anybody know this social uh, psych construct uh, stereotype threat? It shows up in the literature a lot around, say, testing and math and science and this kind of thing. And basically the idea is, is if a population knows that a stereotype is out there, well, a boy is going to do better in math and science, right? Uh, minority students won't do as well as majority students. Whatever the, the stereotype is, that whether it's true or not, is neither here nor there. When that stereotype is out there, people develop anxiety and react out of their anxiety as opposed to any truth that the stereotype might have brought. Right? So you remember back to those caricatures, those stereotypes I asked you about at the beginning? Let's take pedophile, that's a doozy, right? We get, we get lots of stuff from Kenneth Pope, from uh, Jeffrey Kotler, who will say something like 80, over 80% 80 of therapists are attracted sexually to their partners, right? And most of the behind the scenes, hugely appropriate, inappropriate sex that comes out is typically male to female, right? Okay, so if I know as a male therapist that a stereotype that might exist is that I might be just trying to groom my clients, whether they're male or female, to have sex with them, how might that limit the type of counseling that I engage with as I sit with that person? How free am I going to feel to be me, to pursue issues of sex, to pursue issues of gender, of whatever needs to happen, right? How much is that threat of that stereotype literally going to hit me, whether consciously or unconsciously, and therefore impinge on my effect, uh, efficacy as a professional? Help seeking, this is nothing new. Lots of um, information out there about men aren't allowed to seek help, right? Gender is a significant predictor of psychological help seeking, okay? Assimilation, we know that this is true certainly in say ca Caucasian populations, um, folks who've been born in the States, it gets even worse for those folks who are in some way not native or not a part of the majority, right? So if folks assimilate into Western culture, uh, it's also in a significant predictor, which means if somebody hasn't assimilated, the, the likelihood that they're gonna come and find counseling, come and ask for help is really quite low. Right? One of my current clients that I'm working with said that he's working with an Asian man and he was telling this guy uh, about his experience in counseling with me and this guy had no idea. I think this guy had maybe been in the States for, I don't know, three, four years. No idea that counseling was even possible. And he says, you mean he, this guy, meaning me, he's not gonna talk about what you talk about? This is confidentiality, right? That, that you can go in and say whatever you wanna say 
and that's just for your betterment, and that's all that is? I mean, this guy was dumbfounded, right? Okay, so um, again, those, um, those folks that, ha that are assimilated uh, might <laughs> seek help more often. Um, the, in the endorsement of aspects of traditional masculine ideology. That would include that hegemonic stuff, that idea I've got to have all my stuff together, I've got to be dominant, I've got to be in charge, right? Is associated with the avoidance of help-seeking behavior. Makes sense, right? Back to that issue of I choose silence when in doubt, right? Men's traditionally advantaged social status, greater control and decision-making power, and higher income than women make it difficult to accept a diagnosis of a mental health disorder, that should say disorder in there, and seek help for this, okay? So back to Albert Brenneman. What happens if Albert goes into, let's say for instance again, Will uh, Smith is a counselor, right? Albert's going in for counseling. How would we diagnose Albert? Right? And even the specter of diagnosis being out there, might that be preclusive of Albert actually asking for help? Right? I remember, again, my first experience, I was with a, I don't know, a man, I'm, I was, I think, mid-20s. I was working with a guy who'd been counseled for a long, long time. He's, I think he was probably in his 50s. And I remember always in the back of my mind, I was wondering, what's the story that he's telling about me? What has he diagnosed me with? So it was a, I was in a graduate program at the time. I think I saw him for about 10 times. At that last session, he says, well, you know, we're, we're kind of wrapping up. Anything that you've wondered, anything you want to know? And I say, yeah, what did you diagnose me with? Right? This, this guy and I hadn't, and it, it, he said it was a V code, right, which really means it's not a formal diagnosis, right? But the whole time I was meeting with him, my expectation was that he was judging me in some way, even if that judgment was supposedly for my benefit. Okay, so here's Ronald Levant. Anybody heard of this term, this construct, alexithymia? It comes from Latin and Greek root roots. You might recognize pieces of the word. Uh, Lexis means word. Thymus means emotion. And so literally translated, alexithymia means without words for emotions. There's a guy, Sifnus, I believe is the way that you say his name, I think it was in 1973, was the first to put alexithymia on the clinical map. Now, alexithymia is not a disorder per the DSM. If the DSM is our sort of taxological guide, um, then, or taxonomical guide, I should say, um, then alexithymia doesn't fit into it. It's more considered sort of a personality structure, if you will, okay? And so this guy Levant uh, looked at this, the more clinical presentation of alexithymia and said, historically men have been diagnosed with, or at least considered to have alexithymia more than women. Here's some, here's some percentages for you. Uh, this is from a study in 1997. The rate of alexithymia, 16.6% among men and 9.6% among women. Okay, so we're not talking about a big percentage of folks, but of those folks who could be quote unquote diagnosable, the preponderance is men. But, he, but what uh, Levant does is he takes that and says, you know, whether this is sort of clinical or not, his postulate is men, because we've been in this patriarchal society, men hold some piece of alexithymia that's normative. Okay? So in other words, maybe it doesn't necessarily become as disabling and dis um, dysfunctional as it is for some of these folks who bear these percentages. But his argument would be, is it likely that if not all men, at least a large chunk of men, walk around with some modicum of not having words for their emotions? So back in the 70s, when this alexithymia first comes out, um, it sat in the psychosomatic or somaticizing literature. Because basically, men would be showing up with physical complaints. And so then this literature is birthed of, hmm, you're talking physicality, but what you seem to be speaking about is emotionality. Okay, so we've got about 30 years of literature on this. Um, again, these are folks who have a difficulty. There's, depending on the alexithymia um, measures that you look at, there's usually about three categories. One will be, uh, does the person know what's in them? Can they feel what's in them? Can they get it up and out? 
That would be the next, the next piece. So it's emotional literacy, it's emotional expression. And then the third would be, how do they do with tracking with the emotions, the exchanges of people around them, and even do they care? Now, let's look at this idea of alexithymia or this NMA uh, hypothesis. Uh, again, I'm gonna keep peppering you with this Freire stuff. Freire would say, to the oppressor, to be means to have. Bradford Keeney, a psychologist back from the, he's a family systems guy who basically has done away with psychology, saying it's too fear-based, um, says here in the West, we're so interested in understanding things. And we're so disinterested in experiencing things. And so he'd say we need to understand less and experience more. Well, it doesn't make sense that potentially, if, we've, if men have been taught to be doers, action type people, less feelers, that literally their bodies would bear the marks of this, right? That they would either have a, not know what their feelings are or not know how to get them out. And again, what happens when that man, if he is alexithymic to whatever degree, becomes a therapist? And what happens to the exchanges that he has with his male and female clients? This is fascinating. This is from, this is a study of Levant. This is someone speaking about Levant, which is why the, the author is anonymous. Although boys start life with greater emotional reactivity and expressiveness than girls and retain this advantage until one year of age, they become less verbally expressive than girls at age two and less facially expressive by age six. So there's lots of literature that, that's out there looking at gender differences and gender similarities, right? But Le what Levant is saying is boys don't start out alexithymic. Boys don't start out in a deficit. Right? But there's something about the ways in which we raise our boys that seems to teach emotion out of them, seems to teach them to have instead of to be. And uh, Levant just quickly will, will speak about all kinds of gender strain that can come for men here. One is just the, the discrepancy piece of uh, he doesn't live up to the ideal. He isn't able to play by the rules of that male code that Brandon was speaking of. Another is, okay, he's living up to it. Maybe he's a really successful Microsoft guy or Boeing guy or whatever, academic, right? But his world is falling apart because he's buckling under the pressure. Maybe we have really successful psychologists or counselors who are doing their darndest to play by gender rules and it's killing them, right? And then trauma. Experiences as, so basically this would be the person sees or feels the strain and the differences, the discrepancies, their experience of it becomes traumatic in some way. He looks very specifically at these, um, these populations, so men of color, athletes, vets, survivors of abuse, gay and uh, bisexual men. These are populations that Levant has tested and has said, yep, this sort of gender strain can be not just harmful but traumatic to folks. Okay, John Gottman. Love John Gottman. I've passed through two out of three of his levels of certification. His most recent book is looking at the experience of trust and betrayal in relationships. Gottman has found, back from, uh, boy, he's, these findings have been around for a decade or two, I believe, that in heterosexual relationships, men flood consistently more than others. Now, what is flooding? If alexithymia was, a male has a hard time recognizing what's in him, flooding is, I don't know what to do with what's in me, okay? So whether it's a client, it's my wife, it's my boys, whatever it is, something just happened, my heart rate has just peaked to somewhere probably between 92 to 105 beats per minute. All of a sudden I'm physiologically flooded, which basically means I'm in fight flight land and I'm basically interacting to save my life. Okay? So in a moment where I'm feeling judged by my wife, for instance, or I'm concerned of what my client is thinking about me, I can become flooded and literally my ability to be creative, my ability to be fully who I am goes like this, right? And I probably got just a few responses that are possible there, including fight flight, okay? Uh, being flooded often is the cumulative effect of repeatedly getting into a physiological fight or flight state. Remember back to Brandon's idea, part of that male code is the give them hell, 
right? We're sort of endorsing a fight-like mentality for men. So some men live basically instinctually, meaning there, there's some level of perpetuity for them in this fight-flight response, which means they're flooded most, most of the time whether they know it or not, and that's how they respond. And ultimately what Gottman's going to argue is um, what happens is the more a man is flooded, actually the more any person is flooded, uh, the more likely they're going to be to experience betrayal in relationship. He ends his text, and again, this is uh, speaking specifically, uh, or at least a piece of this is going to speak specifically to heterosexual couples. Um, but here we go. Men with lower heart rates are less likely to invoke one of those four horsemen. Okay, so depending on how much I get flooded and whether I know what to do or what not to do with my flooding, um, I will either invoke one of those four ho horsemen, uh, and they are, for the record, the stonewalling. Uh, there's also contempt, defensiveness, and criticism. Uh, Gottman's um, idea is any four of those are deadly to relationship. Um, so men that are able to physiologically regulate better will uh, be less likely to use a four horseman. The ultimate goal of relationship per Gottman is that each couple learns to regulate, to soothe each other. Uh, if I start getting heated up, my wife knows how to help me to cool down, right? Um, and um, this is an interesting piece. Mistrust and betrayal are more likely for heterosexual couples in which men have too much power. So even as we think about it, if you're working with couples in your office and you're coming up against some of the traditional heterosexual stru structure of the man's the head, well, that's going to most likely increase experiences of mistrust and betrayal a la Gottman. I went to a talk. Uh, do you all know the name Bessel van der Kolk? Uh, World-renowned researcher in trauma. Went to a talk uh, by him uh, December 2010. And he was arguing that it is where the, f the state of our field has gotten to with talk therapy borders on being unethical. Because he argues that much of what we invite clients to do is to sit and speak about their lives when literally their brains aren't ready to do that. He looks specifically at the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. These are things that help people to, the hippocampus is in the brain stem, helps people to literally breathe stay focused in the moment. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex helps people to remember context. So again, a man who gets flooded, what might happen is, happen is he loses context. He sort of forgets where he is and has a sort of little freak out moment, right? And what, what uh, Van der Kolk argues is much of the structure of counseling is set up that, well, but you're just supposed to talk through that. And so his argument is, you know, that's not so ethical. And his, um, his argument for the best treatment, especially for somebody who's been through trauma, I think this is fascinating, improv theater or yoga. Because he'll say men, are, men and this isn't just men, but I'll sort of take it and shoehorn it a bit. Men can go and move in a gym, right? That's okay per that uh, traditional male role, right? And even theater, the, you know, a man might not necessarily be inclined to go to theater, but if they were, if they were willing to do improv, they would get a chance to try on feelings in a sort of fantasy sort of way, in a drama sort of way, where they don't have to say, I'm sad, but they could act out sadness. So this could be a, a teaching piece. And ultimately, Van der Kolk's idea is we are to assist our clients' bodies, literally, when their bodies aren't ready to do what we expect for them to do in counseling. And so hopefully, part of what you hear me saying is I'm concerned um, that part of what we've done uh, in the counseling world um, is we've expected men to be more prepared to do the work than they actually are. Basically, the, the lay of the land these days, especially here at Argosy, is about 80-20. Uh, the gender layout is uh, in masters and basic grad, grad programs in psychology. 80-20 um, is the typical guideline. 80% of students are females, 20% are males. And so again, back to what um, Van der Kolk is speaking of here, it kind of makes sense, especially if we think of men. Um, if men get into the position of being a therapist, um, and they haven't been taught to regulate their affect, and even in their grad programs, if they're in the minority, if they're hidden that way, and maybe some of their peers understand emotional literacy and expression differently than they do, doesn't it make sense then that they'll be ill-prepared to work with their clients when it comes time for them to do that?
Carol Gilgan, anybody know this name? Classic researcher in social science. She puts out this book in a different voice. Um, she was one of the first to speak against the idea that we have these developmental stages that are all laid out by men, right? All these ways of, here's how we know what normal healthy development is in people. Well, we have male versions of what's norm normal and healthy, right? And so part of what Gilligan's research found was men seem to be, from a normative perspective, men seem to be tilted towards justice and achievement. There that is again, right? Whereas women seem to be tilted towards compassion and relationship. Well, if any piece of that holds true, Again, it makes sense why we have the demographics that we do in grad per programs and in mental health facilities, right? That most women are doing what's considered relational work, right? If men are taught to lead the charge as doers, therefore they get wrapped up in telling stories of ability rather than willingness. Here's where my experience comes in. So again, I've been working with men, I don't know, 13, 14 years in a clinical um, perspective. And what I find about most of the men that I work with is they come into our work, whether it's in a couple's context, it's in an individual context, they come in telling a story about ability. Meaning what they have been able to do in life, what they haven't been able to do, where they've succeeded, where they haven't succeeded, where they feel like a failure, where they've got what's called the imposter complex, right? And they're waiting to be found out, right? But what I find is that when we move, when I move in conversation with men from talking about ability into talking about willingness, stories begin to change. Now here's where I learned this personally. Back this, this past May, I ran a full marathon. Never thought I'd be able to run a full marathon. And in fact, during the marathon itself, I had, a, had significant problems going on with my left leg. The second half of that marathon was probably the worst pain in my life I've ever had. I wasn't sure I was gonna make it, and yet I did make it. And I got back, I uh, came back to work, I ran on a Sunday, I came back to work, and I realized the story that I was telling about my running of the marathon was complicated by the idea that I had had the goal for myself of running that marathon in four hours and 30 minutes. And I ran it with the injury in four hours and 35 minutes. Now that five minutes started to mess with me something fierce because I was telling a story of ability. And of course, what do, what's the first question that people ask in a marathon? You know, you've completed a marathon. Oh, cool, what was your time, right? So I get back and people are asking me this question and I'm, a part of me is going to shame, is going to, I failed, right? Because I had set out the goal for myself of 4.30, I get injured and I don't quite make it. But then what I realized for myself is the work was, I was messed up, again, worst pain in my life, and yet I was willing to finish that puppy, right? And so I believe one of the ways that we can make a dent in normative male lexithymia, in the flooding experience that happens so often with men, um, is to invite them to tell stories of willingness, to invite them to, to, to expose for themselves and even for the relationship. Where have they been playing by an economy that's zero sum, that's winner and loser, that's dominance based, that's hegemonic, right? All this stuff that I've been talking about here for a while. And where can they sidestep step that into saying, okay, you haven't been the dad that you wanna be. What are you willing to do at this point? You don't have custody of your kids, okay. You could tell a story of ability there. Well, I can't do this because of this and that. Okay, but what are you willing to do? Um, I've, I've found significant gains clinically uh, when I move into conversations of willingness. And again, back to Fiori's idea of oppressed and oppressor, oppress, oppress, oppressor and oppress. Um, I think especially if um, the women, whether um, it's women in men's lives, female clinicians, whoever it is, the women in the lives of men can help to step them out of those conversations of ability, the better. If there is anything to Gilligan's idea that women understand compassion, then, then maybe, my wife certainly was compassionate to me, and saying, what are you talking about? You ran a marathon. This is all well and good, but who cares? Or what do we do with all of this, okay? It's not new news that men don't go to counseling, that men show up in substance abuse treatment facilities and in prisons, right? That's not new news, right? But what is the new news piece? Let's look. Um, following Freire's lead, as with any form of oppression, it's important to acknowledge the potential. 
So I'd say it's really important for us as a field to acknowledge, even just by way of demographics, whether it's the female clinicians, the male clinicians, it's important for us to think about how are we responding to engender stories that we've been handed. And we need for the oppressed to speak. Again, this is where I think it's great news that we have so many women clinicians. Wonderful news, good news for men, right? The oppressed must be their own example in the struggle for redemption. Part of my irritation in clinicians, and maybe especially male clinicians, is those that, um, back to Freire's idea of to be is to have, those that like to sort of wax eloquent and have lots of in interpretations over their clients, but don't necessarily know how to engage them, right? Um, if we've been handed any sort of objectifying impulse that way, uh, I believe change can come as we have folks that are more relational and that lead us in that way. And of course, we need to give up any naturalistic uh, fallacies about what is, is what ought to be. Specifically for clinicians, here's what I'd say. I hope we can think systemically. I hope we can think of men as a hidden population. I hope we can think of alexithymia as a potential so so, um, uh, sociological or societal interject. That idea of uh, men are holding this for a culture that's really harmed them by limiting them in terms of what they're allowed to be and not allowed to be. Uh, oftentimes we know men are the linear thinkers, right? Killers for a relationship, linear thinking, right? So how, as you sit with male clients, for those of you that are clinicians, um, how do you invite them to think circularly? To not think A plus B equals C. My wife does that, it ticks me off, and then I stonewall. Okay, well what's the dance there? How does your stuff and her stuff combine? Don't judge, normalize would be the second. Remember that many men may not know what they feel or may be overwhelmed by what they feel and they choose natural fight flight reactions or maybe even their body chooses them for them. Be mindful of contempt. I, found that I find this in myself. Again, I can be like Will Smith, right? This was where I really felt pegged by McCarthy and Metz of as I sit with a couple, let's say, a heterosexual couple and that guy is looking like an idiot. He's looking like a buffoon. And it's his wife who seems to be able to track with the contents of the conversation and wants to move it along. Will I judge him? Implicitly, will I judge him? Will I act like Will Smith? Well, come on, Albert, let's kind of pull you into looking like you should look because you sure look silly right now, right? Or will I find a way to be supportive and educative of him in a way that he's not accustomed to? So don't uh, be mindful of contempt. Don't pity, they're there. Right? I think also a really negative story of ability is I hear this from men a lot. Well, my dad, I never, my dad wasn't around. Right? I never got from my dad what I needed. He wasn't able to do that. He was a product of the silent generation. Humbug. Right? Always we have choices. Always there's context, of course. And always we have choices in terms of what we'll be willing to do out of, story, out of what we're able to do or stories of ability that we tell. So, be mindful of contempt. Don't pity, don't coddle. Normalize and educate. Uh, if you know Marshall Rosenberg uh, and his nonviolent communication, it's a great template for how to interact with folks clinically, I believe. Be concrete. I find this with some of the guys that I work with. They literally don't have the language that I wish they had to be able to have conversations about emotion. So I can either steamroll over them, in essence, oppress them, or really make sure that I'm speaking concretely. And I can refer, right? If I wanna follow Van der Kolk's lead, I can refer to yoga, to improv theater. I can, right now I'm uh, reading a book with a guy about emotions. Groups, spiritual communities, mentors, places that men can get what they've never gotten. And let's end here, and then I wanna see what your thoughts are. Let me jump just a little bit here. I'm going to end to, here we are, a training program. Argosy certainly has, I'm the BA Psych Chair, and we've got grad programs, right? What can training programs do to, to make a dent in this? Here's some ideas that I have under a quote from Freire. At all stages of their liberation, the oppressed must see themselves as women and men engaged in an ontological and historical vocation of becoming more fully human. So I guess I wonder, how can training programs invite their constituents to be more human? Uh, could, uh, might the exploration of explicit emotional content 
the basic feelings in life, sad, mad, bad, these kind of things, right? Might that need to show up in curricula in ways that it doesn't? We can talk about feelings all over the place, but literally, does a man know what feeling sad is like? Uh, might training programs benefit from more explicit attention paid to the body of the therapist? So again, physical literacy. Uh, these guys cite a study that says 73% of men masturbate to relieve tension. So that says one of the ways that guys know if they get anxious, what they know to do is to soothe through masturbation. Well, are there other ways that men might be taught to soothe? Might training programs benefit from the introduction of more explicit movement? This is Vanderkolk, right? Improv theater. Well, that's a great class to take, right? So let me pause here and say, what do you think? What do you think either about what training programs can do or even what do you think about anything that I've said? We have a few minutes for Q&A. What do you think? I struggled a little bit in this because, of course, I come from a feminist background. Yeah. And so I... It's going to take me a little while to think about it, but one of the things that um, it was interesting to me is that this Legos, it, as the beginning point, yep. there's this whole girls Legos thing, which actually I find quite oppressive to mm, girls. You bet. Right, because For sure. it's all cooking For sure. stuff and whatever, sewing. And you got it. <laughs> and so, you know, it's the boys wanting to play with the girls, like that's the only Legos they get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're not allowed to mm -hmm. play construct erector sets or whatever right. to, to do the things that boys have always done with Legos. And you bet. It's just like we need to really unpack the whole gender stereotyping. For sure. My, my sister um, sent me a great, knowing I was doing this talk, sent me a great YouTube video, you might find it, of this little girl. She's got to be like three or four. She's in a toy store and is saying, how come girls have to be princesses? How come they can't be superheroes? How come they have to have the pink and the boys have to have the blue? You bet, that's where oppression oppresses both sides, right? It's hugely oppressive for a girl to think she can only be a princess. Do you all know that Disney is coming out this next summer with the, their first story of a female protagonist who isn't a princess? It's called Brave. It's a, I think she's gonna be a Scottish, I don't know what. But Disney's finally, I mean, and, and there's a dilemma, right? All the fairy tales that we've been handed in some ways paint the girls as princesses, right? So you bet, this is, I, I hope that you can hear that is hugely oppressive, that me wanting to hold that up as oppressive and say, and this is too, yeah, yeah. But thanks for acknowledging the struggle, yeah, yeah. Please. Um, it's just a sense I had, when you talk about the oppressor, your women helping men in that sense, um, to, I, I understand that. I have a bit of a reaction to why are we, as women, responsible for that? You bet. And you bet. I, I also wanted to hear uh, if you have a suggestion for men, what they can do for themselves to be more educated, more open to those ideas. Yeah, um, so to speak to the first part that you gave there first, it's important if we, if we use Freire as the backbone of this oppression model, his argument is um, for, women need to seek their own liberation first. Right? And it's sort of the social modeling, the social influence process that as they become more fully who they are, they invite men to acknowledge their own limits, right? So anything that a woman is doing for a man really sort of harkens back to that same objectification, right? So I, I really appreciate that point. Um, what can men do? You know, I, I, was, I was thinking a lot about, I, I played soccer growing up, um, and I, I played in this little community where the dads in the community were coaching soccer, but they had never played themselves. So they were nice guys, but they were using football rules and ideas to teach soccer, right? And then my, my younger sister comes along 10 years later, and she actually gets soccer coaches that have played soccer themselves, so they actually get it. Right? So for a guy that wants to be a counselor, boy, I hope he's been in therapy himself, 
right? Um, I think we need to be speaking about this, certainly, right? The good news is this gender conversation is not new to this presentation. Certainly men, are, I think, are, are getting a sense that they need to reconstruct their sense of what gender's all about. Um, but I sure do hope that we can reconceptualize strength as something other than having one stuff together. This is something I continue to work out in my relationship with my wife, right? She tells me that when I'm most attractive to her is when I let myself fall apart in her presence, right? But everything in me says don't fall apart in her presence, she won't think you're attractive, right? And so I think it's especially for those of us that have some sense of this, some awareness of this, to speak of this to men. And then also to, again, re-envision our structures and our infrastructures of clinical practice. If we're set up to do talk therapy, we're, we might keep our male clients hidden, meaning we're, they might come, but they're not coming back, right? You got it. I think I probably need to close this down time-wise. Thanks for coming. I'm available for questions or what have you after. Thank you.